Hello, welcome back. This is Gabriel Palmer. We're going to be talking about processes and effectively their API, how we actually program for processes. So when we think about programming something, we typically think about APIs, abstract programmer interfaces, right? Collections of methods and functions that we use to modify data structures or systems. In this class, we're gonna learn definitely that. We're gonna look at the APIs for processes, but we're gonna learn how different processes feel than a lot of the traditional types of programming abstractions that you're used to. And that's effectively because the APIs that we're using to control processes are actually controlling something that is a side effect. Um, the output of the function actually isn't that important. It's actually the side effects of the function that are the most important, right? Um, or put another way, the effects of the call are the whole point of the call itself. We're going to be looking at different APIs for this, for creating processes, tearing them down, coordinating between processes, and next class we're going to dive into communicating between processes. So let's dive in. Some of the core process system calls that one might make include fork, exec, exit, and wait. And these actually define a lot of the entire life cycle of a process. So fork, for instance, is the system call for actually creating a new process. The new process that's created is actually identical to this one, except for two things. One, it has a different process identifier, and two, the return value for the, the fork call is um, variant depending on which one of the processes that we're executing in when the fork returns. So this gets really weird, and let's start with the diagram at the bottom. When we actually call fork, it actually ends up returning two times in two separate processes. So one time it returns in what we call a parent process, and then the return value of fork is the ID of the child process. So you know you're the parent if you're past the ID of the child that was created with the fork call. The second time within the system that the fork returns is within the child process. And then it returns a zero. So it's effectively saying, hey, I'm the child, I'm going to go and continue to execute. So this is really, really weird. This feels like a very different type of a function to call in any other because it kind of returns twice and returns different things depending on which type of a process it is. And again, I just want to emphasize this feels strange because we are executing fork mainly for the side effects of fork, which is to create a new process. And then because we've created a new process that is virtually identical in every way, um, till the previous process, except for the ID, um, we need some way to determine which one of these new processes is returning from fork, and that's why the return value is a great discriminator in fork. Now, fork has actually not stood the test of time very well. It actually turns out to be a relatively um, difficult to use and uh, nuanced um, system called that actually has a lot of process, a lot of problems. Um, there's a great Hot OS paper that was written a couple of years ago that I can link if you're interested, um, diving into the problems with Fork. I'm not going to go into that here. It is the main system call used in Unix, and it is what XV6 uses, so unfortunately we're stuck with it. Um, Okay, so that's how we actually create a new process, and it actually copies the entire virtual address space of the process that's calling fork and makes a new copy of all of it for the child. So you can imagine this feels a little expensive. Um, second, we can call exit. Any process can call exit at any time, and it can pass in some return value, which is an integer value. And you see in the diagram at the bottom right, um, in this case, the child is calling exit, and the whole, so exit is a way that we terminate from a process, and the whole reason why we're actually passing in a return value to something that is asking for us to be terminated, this feels very strange, um, is because that return value 
is can actually be passed to the parent. So there's an interesting form of communication between a parent and a child that happens here. And that's effectively that the exit, the value, the return value passed into the exit can get passed to the parent as the as the return value from a wait system call. So wait is a system call that a parent can execute that effectively blocks it, that effectively puts it onto a run queue associated, on, sorry, onto a blocked queue, a wait queue, effectively associated with the child. So remember all of our process transitions from last class, this is effectively taking the parent, which was running when it executed wait into a waiting state or a blocked state because we are waiting for the child. What are we waiting for? Well, we're waiting for the child to execute exit. By executing exit, the child says, I'm terminating, and that triggers the parent to be able to continue execution. So there are two purposes for this. One is so that the child can pass the return value up to the parent, and two, um, so that the parent can effectively just wait for the child to exit. And you actually have a pretty good intuition about this happening already, to be, um, to be honest. And that's because, you know, you have experience with shells. When you're in a shell and you type in a command such as ls, well, you don't get a shell prompt back until ls, the program, can finishes executing. What's happening there is that the LS, the shell program is forking a parent and a child, and the child is somehow executing LS. I'm not going to go into that quite yet. After it finishes executing LS, it calls exit. The parent in the meantime, which is actually the shell program, is waiting for that child to finish. So the reason that our shell prompt only comes back after the command that we execute is effectively just because of the wait system call. So let's look at this in code, because I think it's really hard to conceptualize unless we do. So at the very top, we have the fork system call, and we're effectively just calling fork saying create another child, and that returns the process identifier, or zero if we're the child, right? Um, the PID of the child, or zero if we are the child. So next, we check to see if we are the child. Notice that if we are the child, we have an exact copy of the virtual address space of the parent. Any local variable, like the PID variable, that we modify is not modified in the parent because it is a copy. It is not the same address space anymore, okay? Um, so the first condition here is if um, we are PID zero, then we are a child, right? And what are we going to do if we're the child? Well, we're going to try to now execute some sort of another program. If we're, for instance, implementing a shell, then exec is the system call that actually allows us to execute another program. And what exec essentially says is get rid of the entire address space that I'm currently executing in, terminate all of the current execution, and replace that execution with the contents of the program passed in as an argument. So within the bin directory, there's some ret42 program, and we're essentially saying, hey, execute lat within this process, please, right? So fork is very strange, and exec is very strange range in somewhat um, opposing ways. Fork creates a new address space, exec gets rid of it, right? Um, and executes something new within it. Now, when we execute ret, it does get rid of most of the execution within the program, and it will start executing that program that we refer to, which you see on the right here. So that is the child. We know that's the child at this point. Um, and the child, in this case, let's just say, is executing a small little program that just returns 42. Nothing more, just returns 42. Very simple, okay? Now, to see what happens after the child returns, because that's effectively terminating the process in some way, we have to see what the parent is doing. So most importantly, the parent here is calling wait. And like we said, wait blocks the parent until the child is, has completed execution. Because the child is executing in a new process, ret42, and simply returning immediately, we know it pretty much 
terminates its execution pretty quickly. So what happens is that 42 value that was returned from main ends up getting passed as the second return value in, from the wait system call. So now retval gets populated with that 42. Okay, and <clears throat> we get to all, it also returns the process identifier that actually failed, but okay, I'm uh, gonna skip over that. It's not as important. Now, I want to point out that the wait system call, it really does block the parent forevermore until the child returns. So if you look at the child now, you see that there's an infinite loop. So that infinite loop is never going to return, which means that not only is the child infinitely looping, but the parent is blocked on the block queue for the child waiting for it to terminate, right? So this is a consequence of actually using wait. Now, if you look at the flow of list, we already saw that 42 would get returned from the process that somehow got passed to the, the ret valve um, return from wait, and you can see that here we're just printing out that retval, and if we were to run this on the command line, um, we would see that in this case fork test would print out 42. So this printf would print the, the value 42 that we got from the execution of the child. So this is a little bit of a, a walkthrough of how a lot of this works with the fork API. It's not straightforward and it is very confusing, again, because it's very unlike a lot of the APIs that we've used before. I think it's important to be able to understand complex APIs, even if they are new, right? Okay, so let's... Um, Let's revisit a little bit, bit of this. Let me um, re-emphasize it. Penny's very excited about this part because she wants to test her knowledge, right? Um, okay, so the parent may call fork. Oh, that's actually the point. It becomes the parent, and it also runs a child process. Both the parent and child return textually from that call to fork. They're discriminated by the return value from fork, whether it's zero for the child, or if it is a positive value, a PID value, process identifier, which corresponds to the child if we're a parent. The parent can wait. If you wait, you stop executing until your child exits effectively, until it returns from main. Um, <clears throat> and we'll see why those two things are equivalent. Uh, a parent can kill its children. So this is where I just start to actually love the process API in Unix. Like it's all archaic, fork is weird, it's not easy to use, exec is weird, it's not easy to use. But then you realize that a parent creates its children and then can kill them, right? This is just like part of our, pr our process API in Unix. Somebody had a, a grim sense of humor and it gets better. We'll see in a second. Um, so, kill is a system call that can send a signal to a child. We'll get into what a signal is a little bit later, but it's essentially an event that a parent can send to a child to cause some execution in a corresponding handler in the child. So it's a way for a parent effectively to say, hey, you should stop executing what you're doing. I have an event that you need to take care of, right? So given this high-level understanding of all of these different pieces of the process API, um, here are a few questions that I'd like you to think about for a little bit. Um, I'm talking about how to create new processes, but I haven't actually kind of said what the first process is, right? Um, if there's only a way to create processes using executing process, that implies that somehow there is a first process in the system. Do you have any idea what that process is called? Um, how does a shell fit into all of this? I've already talked about the shell a little bit in the examples. Um, and a shell does actually wait. So where does a shell call wait um, when you're using a shell, right? Um, what does control C do in a shell, right? And um, is there a way to make a shell not call wait? Is there a way for a shell to continue executing um, while its child process also executes? So think a little bit about all of these one at a time. I'll come back. <clears throat> okay. Um, init is the first process. If you've heard of it, great. If not, that's fine. Um, init just happens to be the first process. It is um, PID zero. 
Um, it is the first thing that executes on your system. If you've heard of system.d, um, it is an init process. There are many different variants of these, and hopefully in a later lab you'll get to play with one. Uh, where does the shell fit in? Well, the shell is one of the main consumers or users of the process API, because every time you type in a command, it's effectively forking and execing that process that you ask. When does the shell wait? Well, the shell waits, like I said, when you run the child process, it waits for the child process to continue, um, and it only gives you your shell prompt back after that child process executes, right? Um, when does a shell not call wait? Well, when you use the ampersand at the very end of your command. So go into a shell um, and type ampersand and you'll see what I mean, right? So very simply, if you have a shell and you want to call ls, great, ls returns immediately. But if you want to call something like a, um, let me use G edit on reset pen um, that will open a program it's not important what's in here helps my little pen tablet um, but you see I don't get my shell prompt back right I don't get my shell prompt back until I terminate the process because the shell was waiting but of course if I want my shell back I can use the ampersand and now all of a sudden both I can execute the child and I can continue executing within the shell, right? So that's simply, of course, like I said, because of the ampersand, which makes the parent within the shell program not call wait. Okay, um, what does control C in a shell do? Well, control C is actually a signal that the shell catches and it sends to its child to essentially terminate. So control C in a shell terminates the thing that's executing, and that's actually the shell sending um, a sig term, as we'll see, to a child. Okay, let's dive into a little bit of the details about how each of these are implemented. So fork, we all have, we've seen so far, creates a copy of the parent's address space. Um, that address space is quite literally a copy. Like you could really think of it as a mem copy of all of the memory within the address space for the processes calling fork, right? Um, in a naive system, that is what it is. In XV6, it is quite literally that, right? So it copies all of the memory within the process. However, copying is actually one of the slowest things that you can potentially do on a modern processor. Um, because it doesn't play well with caches. Um, to understand what I mean here, you have to realize that caches are really the only thing that holds us, um, that provides us any semblance of fast execution on modern microprocessors. So if we didn't have caches, our CPUs would effectively be running about 300 times slower than they do currently. And that is obviously unacceptable. 300 times slower, you know, would take us back to the 70s or 80s in terms of computation. So we don't want that. Caches execute much faster than memory and therefore allow our processors to feel much, much faster than if we were just accessing memory directly. So why does copying interplay badly with modern caches? Well, if you copy a large piece of memory, let's say that you copy 256 kilobytes of memory, right? And that's basically if your virtual address space is that large, that's how much you would need to copy uh, during a fork. Well, that is larger or about the size of L2 caches on a lot of systems. So as you do that mem copy, you're touching all of the regions within memory that you're copying from and all of the regions of memory that you're copying to. So you're effectively touching 512 kilobytes of memory. And that is pulling all of that memory up into your caches and evicting all of the memory that was in cache. So your caches have worked really hard to try to keep the most important, necessary memory 
in cache as they can. And you just flushed it all out effectively by executing a massive mem copy. So fork is exceedingly slow, not just because executing is slow, but also because you are interplaying badly with the caches, which will make the execution even after fork executes much slower because it's no longer in the cache. So fork is real slow. Fork is real bad in that sense. You can actually feel how quick fork is to execute on XV6 because of how slow it is. It's that bad, right? Um, and it gets worse. Um, this is like the inverse of a, a late night advertisement, right? But wait, there's more. No, no, no. This is like, but wait, it gets even worse. It gets worse because exec is the system call that actually, in the majority of cases, is executed immediately following a fork, right? Whenever you do fork in a shell, it's almost immediately followed by an exec. Well, let's look at what exec does. Exec, like I said before, essentially says, let's get rid of the entire current process and load in another program to execute within this process, right? So it's saying get rid of all of that virtual address space that we just copied. What does this look like? Well, fork says, yeah, please copy the whole address space. Please, thank you. Um, and that's very slow for reasons that I talked about. And then almost immediately following fork, we essentially say, oh, can you just kill this whole address space and replace it, please, thanks, with something else? Um, that's not great. We're essentially doing all this work to copy it and then doing all this work to get rid of it to load in a new process. So none of that makes sense. None of that is good, right? But unfortunately, this is the API that Unix provides for us. Um, so it's kind of what we have to work with. Windows has a much saner um, API. Our research operating system composite has a much saner API. Um, but this is what Unix provides for us. So people, instead of complaining like I am, have said, well, okay, yeah, 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 this is a bad API, blah, 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 blah. But could we just do some solid ass engineering and make this real, real fast? Can we make this work, right? Yes, we can actually do a few things. So let's actually just look at the core of the problem. The core of the problem is that we're copying all the memory and then getting rid of it. Is there a way that we could somehow avoid copying all the memory? Well, the first option is, well, yeah, let's actually change the API a little bit, right? So let's do a V fork. This is another system call um, that's a modification of fork. And what it says is, okay, V fork will stop executing the parent until the child execs, and it will not fork the address space. In fact, it won't change the address space at all. It'll just have both the parent and the child continue using the same address space. When the child doesn't exec, then it will essentially create a new process and do the whole um, exec thing. So run a new uh, program within that process. But this is really weird. This effectively means you have like a parent and a child that are effectively using the same address space. If the child goes and modifies a whole bunch of stuff in the address space before exec, for instance, if it returns from the function um, in which fork was executing, well, now all of a sudden you've modified the stack frames that now the parent is going to use when it starts executing. So like the only valid way to use vfork is within the same function almost immediately doing an exec. So I will say unequivocally that vfork is pretty much a hack through and through and is not actually a great API, right? It's trying to improve a bad API by adding some performance to it because we no longer need to copy the memory and get rid of those copies, but it's effectively doing that by making the whole thing even more difficult to use when it was already pretty hard, right? So COW, which stands for copy on write, is another approach. And COW is really smart. What it effectively says is that the virtual address space mechanisms provided for us by the hardware, which we haven't, um, we haven't investigated yet, that's in about a, a month's time, um, those copy on write um, pieces of uh, 
I mean, sorry, the virtual address space pieces of the hardware, let's try to use those to our advantage. One of the things that they allow us to do is to make certain regions of memory only readable. We saw this last class when we saw that when we obj dump different sections or segments of an executable, some of them, for instance, the code, are marked as read only, read and execute, right? So that's interesting. Um, it effectively means that some, some memory can be marked as read only. So what we do with copy on write is we somehow make new copies of the virtual address spaces, but we populate the virtual address space for both the parent and the child with memory that is entirely read only. So neither the parent nor the child are able to actually um, execute really any of their um, code. The first time that they execute a store instruction, that will cause an exception. And this is where the brilliance of copy on write memory comes in. It essentially says that we don't need to copy all of the memory in a virtual address space when we fork. All that we need to do is ensure in the parent and child that all of the memory is shared between them and is marked as read only. When we do a, when either the parent or the child does a store to any of that memory, in the exception handler for that instruction, we will actually at that point copy a, that region of memory that's being accessed. And we don't need to copy all of the memory in the program, we can just copy a relatively small region of the memory that's being accessed. So this means that we have additional overhead for having, handling all these exceptions and doing these delayed copies of the memory. But this is the brilliant of the mechanism, the brilliance C, the brilliance of the mechanism. We only need to copy the memory that absolutely has to be copied because it's being modified by either the parent or child, right? So we do are copying memory, but only the memory that has to be copied, right? So this is really cool. And it, people have found out over time that a vast minority of your virtual address space is actually modified. So this um, implementation actually pays off quite a bit. Now I do want to emphasize that when we copy the memory, when a store is done to one of those, uh, a piece of memory, when we copy it, then we can add it back into the virtual address space for both the parent and child as read writable. So now both a parent and child can modify can modify that memory, um, including the store that's about to happen, right? So copy on write is absolutely brilliant engineering and is used everywhere. However, it is there to kind of solve a fundamentally kind of uh, adversarial part of the Unix API that fork into exec really doesn't make much sense. Um, okay. Now let's go to the exit call. So the exit system call effectively says that you don't want to execute anymore. That's it. So this is the way for the only way for a process to actually terminate its own execution intentionally, right? So this releases all of the process's current current resources back to the system and discontinues execution. That means we free all of the memory in the virtual address space, we free the process control block. Um, we free the kernel stack, all of that stuff associated with the process, we don't need it anymore, with a small little exception, which we'll see in the future, um, which we'll see in a few slides. Uh, as we saw, exit does take an argument, which is the, the return value that we wish to pass back to the parent, right? Um, this is actually kind of, we'll see, the same as returning an integer from the main function. So we know that when we return from main, as you see here in this program, that exits the program. So why am I saying that exit is the only way to actually exit the program? Well, to see why, first, let's go through a little exercise. If we just replaced our return 42 with an exit 42, that effectively does the same thing in every way, shape, and form, right? It passes that 42 back to the parent that executed um, this program, be it a shell, be it something else, right? So when we're doing return 42, there's actually no magic layer. It is actually turning into an exit 42. And it does that based on something that we've seen in class already. 
And that's the fact that when our pro program starts executing, it does not start executing in main. It starts executing in underscore start, which is usually an assembly routine. So I just have kind of, you know, uh, faked a uh, C implementation of it. Um, and what we essentially do here in start is call main. So we actually manually call main from within start. And main, we know, returns an integer, and we simply take that integer and pass it to exit. So when I say exit is the way that we, were, that we um, terminate a program, I really mean it. It's just that Unix and kind of how main works kind of hides that fact from us in most cases, which is quite nice. However, I should say the middle implementation that you see here is required by XV6. XV6 does not have a start implementation, as you see on the right, um, that kind of plums the return value from main back to an exit. You need to execute make exit explicitly within XV6. <clears throat> now, here's a complexity of the API. We saw a complex interaction between fork and exec, and here is another complex interaction that is, uh, I would say, perhaps um, um, accidental complexity by the API on the system implementation. And this is simply the idea that when we exit a program, we are passing an argument to exit. As we saw here, we're um, essentially passing 42 which we want the parent to be able to execute, to, to access. So we want the parent to be able to execute wait to be able to get that 42 value from us. But what if when we exit, the parent has not yet actually executed wait? What memory do we store this value of 42 in, in anticipation that the parent might execute wait? It's really not clear, right? Um, if we clean up all of the resources for the child, where does 42 get saved? You can't really save 42 in the parent directly because what if the parent has created n children? Do you save n values within that um, parent, within the, the parent process struct? Um, perhaps, and in Linux, this is roughly equivalent to what ends up happening, but in XV6 and original Unix, that's not what happened. Um, so what ends up happening is that your children that have exited um, or have been killed, as it turns out, um, will turn into zombies until the parent process waits to reap those zombies right? So I want to just, it's going to be hard to um, take that all in until I address it specifically. Yes, parents do spawn their children using fork, and then those can kill those children by sending them signals, or those signals, those children can exit themselves, at which point the children turn into zombies, which hang around in the system until the parent waits for them, right? So in this case, I mean, the good news, of course, is the zombie apocalypse is fended off by simply calling wait. Um, but I love kind of this interaction of names. I'm sure that the original authors kind of had all of this in mind, but it's hilarious. Um, so effectively, the child process will hang around in a zombie state, literally a process state for being a zombie, um, until the parent actually waits on them, only so that that return value from the child can get passed up to the parent, right? Um, so there's this weird interaction between wait and exit, which is in some ways accidental complexity of the entire API. Um, and I've talked about kill a few times. Kill is a um, system call that is actually badly named. Kill actually just sends a signal to a child. And what is a signal? A signal is just a notification of an event. So we've actually already mentioned one of those. If the shell is the parent and it receives a control C keystroke, then what it ends up doing is actually sending a sig term to the child. So it says, hey, 
the user of this shell has kind of asked you to stop executing. So I'm going to send you a signal, right? Um, because I want to send you a notification to terminate yourself. And it does this very civilly by sending it a um, nice signal that says, you know, please terminate. And if the child doesn't um, terminate on its own at that point, then the, the parent will start, send a much more aggressive um, signal, which just terminates the, the child. So... What is the signal? It's a notification of event. What does that end up looking like? Well, that event actually ends up triggering execution within a handler function, just a function defined by that child process. And that handler function can execute at any time non-deterministically within that child. So because it can execute at any time, it can't really execute with a normal control flow of that child's logic. So instead, it needs to execute somewhere else. And the big question is, what stack does it end up using? What registers does it end up using if it's not executing within normal control flow of that child execution, right? And you've actually already used interrupts. You've already, I'm sorry, you've already used signals. You've already used signals because in FOS, where we were faking interrupts in user level, that was essentially using signals. So we faked interrupts arriving asynchronously within the system and interrupting whatever was previously executing simply by setting up timers that triggered signals um, periodically. So signals are in effect user level interrupts. Um, they are taking what is a horrible and difficult thing to use within the kernel, interrupts, and kind of exporting them to user level. That again is a rather questionable um, decision in the first place. Um, so interrupts are an event notification mechanism that ancestors can send to um, children, a parent can send to a child, a grandparent can send to a child, and effectively um, triggers some sort of a handler. And some signals have default behavior. Sometimes they're ignored by the child. Sometimes they by default terminate the child. Or a child can define their own handler to execute them. And in FOS, that's exactly what we did. Um, the dev ISR function was exactly that. So this is the core of the process API. Um, there is a lot more to it, but this is kind of an initial introduction to it. Um, it enables systems to go from a single init process up to a full system. So you executing on your current system, if you're executing in OS X or you're executing in um, Linux, you essentially go from executing one process, which is init, up to everything that you're running, including a GUI, a graphical user interface called X11, um, and everything, right? The API that we've looked at actually provides a lot of ways to coordinate between processes, and that's things like wait, that's things like fork, which actually is a form of coordination, and things like signals, right? And these are sufficient to actually implement most of what you actually require in a normal shell. Um, and you'll see sh.c within xv6 includes a very simple shell without many features, but it uses many of these features that we talked about. Um, X11 or any GUI um, is actually just a visual shell. When you double click on something, that's effectively just forking off a new process and executing the thing corresponding to what you just double clicked on, right? Um, and we talked about some intricacies of process management, and that's effectively um, that terminating processes end up being zombies that parents then need to clean up to react to their return values. Um, and process management ends up being a very important thing. In a lot of environments, it allows us to um, add reliability to a system. If a server application fails, then we might be able to detect that failure in some sort of a wait call or something like it and be able to deal with that failure by perhaps rebooting that process, which hopefully you'll be able to see in a lab. Um, and it just simply allows us to define coordination patterns. So um, that's all that I'm going to go into today. Next class, we will continue by talking about um, more in-depth ways to coordinate between different processes within the system. Thank you very much. Have a good one.